It's 12.05 in the afternoon here on 90.3 FM, and it's time for Joe Steckler, Helping Seniors of Brevard. And here's your host, Joe Steckler. Thank you, John, and welcome to a new, another edition of Helping Seniors. Helping Seniors was started in 2011 to inform and educate and help connect seniors and those that care for seniors with the many, many wonderful services in Brevard County. Some of those services are paid for by the government. Some of them are private care. Some of them are, are here because they've been around Brevard County for a long time helping people. The big problem we have, folks, is making people aware of the many, many, many things that are available. And just yesterday I had a caller that, that called in on, on our car raffle and asked some questions, that, and I answered them, and they said, uh, why don't people know about you? And I said, we do everything we can. We have radio, we have television, we have uh, a newsletter in Senior Scene Magazine. We're in Hometown News. We're, we do a lot with word of mouth. And I said, it just takes time. It takes time to make people aware of good things that are happening. So we get a lot of compliments on what we try to do to help people, and that's important to uh, making this a, um, a better care network. And that's what it's all about. It's all about helping people, and the way we do this is uh, we have a sponsor network. We have a um, we're doing this car raffle. We'll talk about that in a minute, and just a little bit about it because it's almost there, but there's still time to get tickets. And it's mostly getting people involved. And here on ninety point three FM WEJF, it is a talk to me station. We're trying to build this as a talk to me network so that when I have panelists on the show that. Uh, might be able to help you. You can ask a question. Uh, all you have to do is call 722-2-9998. I'm going to take that again. I said it wrong. 321-722-9998. 722-9998. So our panelists today are uh, Jennifer Helen, who is the owner of Seniors Helping Seniors in uh, Jennifer's been on the show several times, but our other panelist, Dr. Liz White, is an audiologist, and she is the owner of Harbor City Hearing uh, Solutions, and uh, I asked her about some things. She says she's the chief cook and bottle washer there, <laughs> and uh, it's um, it's kind of nice to have uh, businesses like this on the radio because... Uh, they're starting out, and they're trying to build a good practice. And so I have a very strong feeling that uh, the young people that are trying to start out in businesses on their own are going to be good service providers. And uh, it's to their advantage to uh, to gain your trust. And that's why I always like to have uh, people like Dr. White on the show because I feel that the answers – not feel, I believe, that the answers that are, they're going to give to a caller or what we discuss here between Jennifer and myself and Dr. White, what we discuss is going to be something that might help you be better informed about today, especially ear care. And uh, since I, I'm a long-time wearer of hearing aids, uh, I've got a lot of questions I could ask Dr. White, but uh, we'll let Dr. White talk about some of what she uh, she. Um, Thanks that you need to know. So let's just start to show off with Dr. White because, uh, Dr. White, uh, how about uh, just talking and telling our our listening audience what an audiologist does, why you believe in what you do, and how you believe that you can help people. Okay. So an audiologist is someone who has a four-year bachelor's degree from a college and then either a two-year master's degree or a four-year clinical doctorate, or even a Ph.D. research doctorate. So well, there is a lot of schooling involved in someone in audiology. Um, why see an audiologist? Ugh, that's, that's a good question. So anyway, um, there are so many people who think they have really good hearing, and then they come see me just on a whim, and they're shocked that they really don't have good hearing because hearing loss is such a gradual process that it takes sometimes 10, 20, 30 years before you even recognize that, oh, I'm not hearing as good as I should. Um, a simple little story is my mother-in-law 
just got hearing aids, she forgot that when she swept the floor that the broom makes a noise. She hasn't heard that noise in who, who knows how many years. Another simple story is people don't remember the turn signal click in the car when it's going left and right. They forget these little sounds. So if we're forgetting little sounds like that that fall into the same frequency range as normal speech, what are we actually missing? And we forget that we are missing it because we don't remember that we used to hear really well 40 years ago. Part of my um, soapbox, part of my shtick, is I want people to start getting their hearing screened or even a baseline test at the age of 40. Most people don't find out, or that once they find out they have hearing loss, they wait 10 to 12 years to do something about it. So in that 10 to 12 years, there's a lot of issues going on. One, we're losing some word understanding. Um, another separate point is something about the, the link between hearing loss and dementia. So the sooner that we can maybe treat it, we'll be helping more people. I can I got a key on that. You mentioned uh, a couple of words that are very familiar to me, hearing loss and dementia. Mm -hmm. what, did, what did you mean about a connection between hearing loss and dementia? So think about if you're seeing someone that, you know, you're just meeting someone, maybe in a, in a church group or in a skilled nursing facility, and they're just kind of sitting in the corner not talking to anybody. People might label them as, well, they, maybe they have dementia. Maybe we should get them tested. But maybe they're truly not hearing. Maybe we're not actually stimulating the ear, the organ of hearing, and then from there we go to the, the to the nerve and to the brain. So if we're not stimulating that, they're just kind of sitting there and just looking like they're missing or maybe they're coming off as rude as well. But hearing loss is one of the nine identif identifiable factors that if we can catch it early enough and treat it early enough, one-third of dementia cases may be delayed or may be written off completely. How would you treat it? Well, we'd have first have a test to see if there is a hearing loss. And then secondly, the most common treatment for hearing loss in, in this grouping is a sensory neural hearing loss, which the best treatment is some sort of um, amplifier or a hearing aid. Okay. You know, I've been going to, to uh, when I retired from the Navy, I had served in submarines and um, I and being on cruisers and destroyers and hearing the dog on guns go off all the time, all that constant banging, and then on, on the submarine, the diesel submarine engine noises and all the noises associated with the diesel submarine. Um, and when I retired, um, I took just an honest test, and I answered when he told me to press the button when I could hear something, I did it. And as a result, I got a 10% disability. Mm -hmm. and actually, it should have been a 50% disability because, hell, I couldn't hear I didn't know that. And everybody would be fussing, Dad, uh, why don't you get your ear tested? Why don't you do this? Why can't you hear? And they get all upset because they couldn't understand them. So when I went to one of the audiologists at the VA, they did some looking really deep into my ears. And how often do you find people that come into you with a potential hearing loss that you find to have wax on the inner ear up in the hairs of the inner ear and if you clean your ears you can't get that out and how often do you find people with deep wax inserts that, that really impair their hearing? So that's a pretty common problem. The problem is people are pushing that wax down into their ear Using Q-tips, you're not supposed to use Q-tips in your ears. You can use it on the outer part of your ear, but you do not want to enter the ear canal because what you end up doing is pushing that wax further down, therefore impacting it. I've seen so many cases of people doing that. And then what happens if you're in the bathroom and someone hits your arm at the door? You're going to end up going through your eardrum and then possibly touching those three little middle ear bones and causing a lot more damage. Wax naturally comes out. Those little hairs in the, in the ear canal force the wax out. So we want to just let the wax do its own job of coming out and not using a technique at your home. Now, some people do have to have it professionally removed. I do that at my office. It's such a gratifying feeling when you get this big piece of wax out of someone's ear. It kind of is exciting for me. Um, but really, don't try to do it. You can use some kind of uh, like um, over-the-counter ear softener to your wax softener to get it out, but that kind of just helps the process. Sometimes you just need to get it to get it done professionally. Uh, and, and a lot of people don't realize that 
I think it's important, and I, I, there's just really never in my in my research a um, we talk about regular dental oh, checkups, you, yeah. and we talk about all that kind of stuff, but we never talk about uh, hearing checkups to. Uh, to, to let an audiologist look into our ears, deep into our ears, up in those inner air follicles up there where that wax gets stored. And the reason I'm talking about it is because I know they took a chunk of that stuff out of my ear one time, and it was amazing. Yeah, so that's kind of another part of my soapbox is we get our eyes checked. We get our teeth checked every six months. No one gets their hearing tested until it's too late. So typically you get your hearing screened as a sixth grader when you're in elementary school, and then not again until you notice that you're having a problem or your children notice you're having a problem. So that span could be 50 to 60 years. Now, think of all that noise exposure that we're having during that time. You're out there cutting your grass. You're maybe going to concerts. Maybe you're out at the gun range or maybe you're hunting, probably all without hearing protection. One single time can actually cause enough hearing loss that we need to do something about it. But like I said, people just aren't coming in and getting their hearing screened. How How do people, let's say if you're 65 or older, does Medicare cover? Uh, Medicare covers a hearing test. Covers a hearing mm-hmm. test. So at that point, you have to have an order from your physician, your primary care doctor, whoever it may be, or you know, a specialist having an order written to have your hearing tested. Okay. Some of the, when you're younger or some of the private insurances, you don't have to have an order for that. Okay. What, but if people don't have, and a lot of people don't have um, insurance that would cover this, but if, if a person had to go into somebody like you to an audiologist to get this kind of test and or check up or ear clean out, like we're talking about, what would the average cost of something like that So a be? hearing test probably wouldn't be more than about $60. So really, it's probably nothing that's going to break the bank. An ear cleaning, you might be looking at 50 to to $100, kind of just depending on how, how much is in there. Like if it's a simple, just pull it out. But if it requires a lot of irrigation or maybe a lot of suction, it might be billed a little bit higher just because of the, it required a little more work. Is this where they take that syringe and push it into the ear and push the warm water into the ear? Yeah, it's such a push great... Push that thing out into the thing that you're holding on your ear side? Yeah, that's what I do at the office. And, oh, man, it's so wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, the reason I'm talking about it because you actually feel better. You do. You don't feel so full. you do that. Yeah. And, you know, I guess it's a pretty good sign. And, and Jennifer's sitting here laughing because and she's known me for a long time. But as you get older... If you really want to be honest about it, uh, you can relate to most of these things that we're talking about. Um, Jennifer, I'm going to get you into the show in just a minute. While we're on a roll here with Dr. White, I want to keep talking about this. Oh, yes, this. keep going, because her face describing that process is, is beautiful. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but it, you know, it's, nice to, to, it's nice to have people on a radio show that are interested in what they're doing and I sense that you are a firm believer in developing a program where the listening audience is better informed about what can be done early on at a lower cost to prevent problems later on. Exactly, preventative medicine. Okay, now, you get a couple of these big ear companies they take up four pages of advertising in Florida today. They've got these hearing aids that looks like a little round plastic thing. You stick that thing in your ear, and you got all these things for a hundred dollars. You got them for five hundred dollars. A lot of people uh, can't afford a, a hearing hearing aid, so they get one hearing aid. Can you discuss, sort of in a in a, in a, a short nutshell? What's important about understanding the value of, of, of a potential customer knowing what to buy for a hearing aid and, and, and these $100 things that you stick in, these, in your ear, these miracle hearing devices, I've seen them. I've tried them. I don't think they work. So what they are, people are misled 
Um, a lot of that is a bait and switch. One, those $100 devices are not hearing aids. They're amplifiers. So they're, you don't need a hearing test for that. When, I, when we test someone's hearing, we're testing from the low pitches to the high pitches. With those, it's just a kind of an overall thing. So if you've got good low pitches but bad high pitches, everything's going up. With hearing aids, we can be very specific and only amplify what is needed. Um, like I said, a lot of those are bait and switch at, or bait and switch processes, which unfortunately a lot of people fall for, fall for is that you, oh, I can get a hearing aid for $399 and this other person told me it was going to be $3,000. Again, that is an older model, most likely hearing aid, if it's even a hearing aid or maybe it's just an amplifier. And it's not going to be probably the best device for that person. What you really need to do is come in, have it, your test done, and then Spend time with the audiologist, with the provider. We need to get to know you. I have some patients that all they do is sit at home and watch TV. They don't need a very sophisticated device. They need something that's simple, that works for them at home, works for them when they go to the doctor's office. But then this morning I had a patient who's in a lot of activities. She plays games. She's out at meetings. She's out at dinner. She's out at karaoke. She needs something that's going to keep up with her lifestyle. So she, uh, a cheaper device, a less expensive device is not going to work for her. She needs something that's going to be higher technology can help in background noise. My research and delving into all this sort of, I believe that there are roughly four companies that make hearing aids. Six. Six? Mm -hmm. Six companies that make hearing aids and supply the world. Mm -hmm. And four of those in the United States? All of them are sold in the United States. One is based out of the United States, headquartered in the United States. Okay. I forgot what I was going to ask. It's important. That, um, but what could a person sort of, the, the, the cost of hearing aids, really hearing aids, you really need them. It's important that you have them for both ears, right? So that's a good question. Most cases, I can't give you a percentage, but most cases, the hearing loss is going to be symmetric. Now, there are some people that have either a really bad ear, and then a hearing aid can't help that ear, and then they have sort of an okay ear. The hearing aid can help this ear. If our word understanding is so poor, a hearing aid isn't going to help that. And then we start talking about some other kind of devices like a cochlear implant. But in most cases, it's kind of like eyeglasses. We don't walk around with monocles anymore. We, we put glasses on both eyes. In most cases, two hearing aids are recommended. You, you said something that's very important that I think a lot of people don't understand. When we talk about uh, people being hard of hearing, uh, people may, be, may need to have the sound jacked up so they can hear what's being said, but even though they can hear what's being said, they will not understand, understand. what's being said, but talk of word comprehension and hard vowel sounds. I uh, had one of my granddaughters talk to me one time on, on a telephone, and I had to have her repeat a word six times before I could understand what the word was. Right. So understanding is part of the testing. We're asking you to repeat words back at a normal level. Words that you're not expecting to hear. You will say gap. You will say wet. You will say fit. You will say whatever. The way that the ear transfers that sound through the organ of hearing, through the nerve to the brain, is very important, and it's part of the counseling process. I have one patient who understood 3 out of 25 words, 12% of words. She's not the best hearing aid candidate. If she, she does wear hearing aids, actually, but she has to be face-to-face -face with you and looking at your lips because she's got to use some lip reading. Her other ear, though, is like 68% understanding. And actually, combined, she does better with, with two hearing aids. In some cases, we think, well, we're not going to put a hearing aid on that ear that only understands 12% of words. But interestingly, her ears together work a lot better than one solo ear. I find that that's exactly true in my case. In my case, um, when you do the testing, uh, my my... The tests go, go like this, mm -hmm. and then you come get. back up. And the last kind of stuff I'm going to ask you before I let Jennifer talk a little bit is when we talk about the business of um, of um, uh, the, the church whisper, 
Um, it takes more than a whisper. Now, I, 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 want, I want your I want all, all the audiologists' opinion on this. Does it take more than a whisper to activate the hearing aid so that they can person can understand what's being said, or will a whisper do it in church? A whisper should do it. However, you're also talking about probably a church that has huge ceilings, tile floors. The acoustics in every room matter. This is a great room because we've got some acoustic foam on the on here, so sounds aren't bouncing off. But people think that when they put hearing aids on, boom, everything's going to be perfect, and it's not. It's perfect one to one. But you add in environment, you add in acoustics, you add in background noise, you add in word understanding, and we're still working with an ear that's damaged. We're not going in there and replacing any parts of the ear. So you have to have very realistic expectations, and your audiologist should be having that kind of discussion with you. Folks, I hope you're, you're getting a, uh, an earful here today <laughs> about what we're talking about because you're getting a heck of a lot of uh, information uh, in, in a very, very well-stated way. Um, Dr. White is uh, giving you uh, information that a lot of you you need. Uh, you know, since this is a Talk to Me Station network, uh, the phone number here is uh, 722-9998. And when we come back after the break, and, and we're still about three or four minutes away from that, but... Um, when you come back after the break, if you have a question of Dr. White, you can sure call us, and you don't have to give us your name. You don't have to embarrass yourself or anything else because you ask what you think is a stupid question. But like we said in school, no question is stupid because the ones that are sitting around are afraid to ask the question are the ones that need the information. So having said that, Jennifer, what are seniors helping seniors? So at Seniors Helping Seniors, we hire seniors to go out and help other seniors so that they can stay home and stay independent. And um, I, in talking to, to Dr. Liz, I really saw how passionate she was about that and one of the, uh, about hearing and hearing loss. And one of the things that we do um, when we first come out is do an assessment, um, make sure we know exactly um, what's going on with this person, with this family, so that we can help in the best way possible. And we'll ask about their hearing. You know, do you wear hearing aids? Uh, because we want to make sure that we are also providing someone who they can hear. If they need someone with a stronger voice, we, we want to make sure we match that person correctly. Um, but I, I often hear, oh, no, no, no. I, I don't want hearing aids. Or, I, yeah, I probably need them, but I won't get them. My sister has had hearing aids since she was 46 years old. So I always tell them, you know, if my sister can have them at that early age, you you can get them too. So I'm I'm really happy to have her here today and talking about hearing well, loss. And I'm happy because I wear hearing aids and I know how important it is to have the right kind of fit. Because Terry and I went to a neighbor's house uh, uh, Easter evening and uh, my um, uh, cardiologist was there, the one that put my second pacemaker in. Yeah, second, she put the second pacemaker in, and uh, the guy that took her place put the third pacemaker in. So uh, I still got. I hope I have more time to get one more, at least one more pacemaker. But anyway, I haven't talked about my pacemaker. But the doctor said to me, she said, "Joe, you seem to be hearing a lot better." Yeah, we got about a minute to go, and she said, "You seem to be hearing a lot better." I, and I said, "Oh." Maybe I am, but she had a, she mentioned this several times. Of course, when I play poker with the guys, they all holler at me because they and they'll they'll give me the hand signals about what game we're playing. But uh, I I just learned my lesson. I don't say or ask a question, and then after the game starts, I'll I'll turn to the guy that's sitting next to me and I ask, "What are we playing this time?" If I haven't figured out what it was, <laughs> so I learned my lesson. It keeps them from hollering at me and. The people that don't have a problem, Dr. White and, and Jennifer, the people that don't have a hearing problem simply are in a different world. They don't understand. So with that thought, we're going we're gonna to wrap it up and we're going to take a mid-show break. And then we'll come back here in about three minutes and uh, we'll get Jennifer to do some talking. I want her to talk a little about the uh, car raffle. So we'll come back and let her talk about the car raffle. But, uh, Doctor, we're not finished with Dr. White yet. So stay with us. It's Joe Steckler Day, helping seniors of Brevard, heard every Wednesday, 12 noon to 1 o'clock. And right now, back to the show and your host, 
Joe Steckler. Thank you, John, and welcome back to our second half edition of today's show. Um, John made a comment about uh, the show and in Rivard County, and I, I just want to take just a second to tell you that uh, I'm getting a lot of calls from people that have followed our radio show for the last 19 years. And um, that's the honest to God truth, people. Um, I have people that have been listening to our show for going for 19 years. They're still listening to it. But what's important is that some of these people that started donating to uh, to our organization when I was the director of the Alzheimer's program are still donating, and they're donating both to the Alzheimer's program and they're donating to uh, helping seniors. And without having you, the listeners, understand the importance of what we're trying to do, uh, we won't make any progress. Uh, uh, The government is cutting back funding, and the government is going to come back more funding this year. The state is cutting back funding. There are six, I I can tell you, every year for the last 15, I keep talking about the waiting list for services. And it varies between 64,000 and 65,000 people on the waiting list. And that, that's ridiculous. We need to do a better job, not just of putting money into the program, but having better managers of the programs that we have. Too often we get people in these positions that are so laissez-faire about uh, what they do how they do their job, and what they think the importance of their work is. In other words, they get to come to work, and they sit there, and then they go home. I can remember years ago that um, when I was on a, a Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, no, I was on the uh, on the CNO's uh, personal staff, and we had one uh, GS employee that the first thing he did every morning when he came to work was to work the crossword puzzle. Every day, he worked the doggone crossword puzzle. It used to drive me crazy because I'd be there trying to get something done, and here this turkey was over, getting paid almost twice as much as I was, and he said they're working the crossword puzzle. Well, we don't do that in, in our organization. We work darn hard, and my only regret is that it's not as big as it should be. We don't have a staff, but... We are we are uh, working on a, a new office in June over at Zahn Beachside on uh, uh, on uh, South Patrick Drive, and uh, we'll have a new office and we'll be able to serve you better. And hopefully by then we'll find somebody that will be the executive director and somebody will be the information specialist, so that I can concentrate a little bit on just trying to um, build some uh, sponsor support to keep our program in place and make it work and have people like Jennifer and Dr. White on the radio show. And then we'll get Dr. White on on one of our TV show tapings and we'll also work towards getting Dr. White as one of our sponsors. And uh, and I say that not with tongue-in-cheek because there are many ways and many levels of sponsorship and, and, and people don't have... They don't have to pay a thousand, two thousand, five thousand dollars. They pay two hundred fifty dollars to get a get an ad in our newsletter for a whole darn year. And think about that: you go to Florida today, and for a four by four ad in the paper, you pay four thousand dollars. For ours, you go to Senior Scene Magazine, and you get for three hundred fifty dollars, you get a five line ad in our Senior Services Director. So somebody says. I want to. I want to know about senior services. You can go to Senior Scene Magazine, open the darn thing up, look in the center of it, and see all these listings about people that help you, a senior, get a a good deal at what you're doing. We have one guy that uh, runs the Allied Appliance. The guy's name is Mike Dingman, and the guy's as honest as the day is long. I've known his founder for years. And uh, Andy has come along doing the same type of work, and he, he's good, and he's honest, and he's fair. And, and and that's important. It's just like knowing what kind of services can seniors get, what kind of programs can we get to help them, where do we go for eye care, where do we go for ear care, where do we go for, for uh, people to come in our homes to take care of us that aren't going to steal us blind. And it is something that happened, doesn't it, Jennifer? 
So what do you do about making sure that your employees are honest people and they take care of the clients first? Good question. So everyone has a federal background check, so we check all 50 states, but we also do a local check. We go through an orientation, and our policy is that we're there for service and we're being paid for that service. We don't take anything else, so we don't take tips. Um, if we take someone out to lunch, we pay for ours. They pay for theirs. Uh, you know, the policy is that we don't take anything. We hire seniors, um, people who have retired. They fold around a little bit. They do this because they want to do it, not because they have to do it. For some, it really does supplement their Social Security. But for most, they don't really do it because they need the money. They do it because they want to help and give back. So it's a totally different mindset of the person that we hire. So, you know, there, there is no um, incentive for them to take anything. They've got everything that they need. They're doing this because they want to. Yeah, but, you know, you mentioned it's about people working uh, past uh, uh, and are older and, and supplementing their Social Security. Uh, there are a lot of senior citizens that do need to work to add a little bit. And when you talk about a little bit, sometimes $200, 300 $400 per month added to a senior's uh, living wage makes all the difference in the world. Um, I, I think it's horrible that I get a caller that will say, when I ask him, how much do you get in food stamps? $15 a month? Yes. That's ridiculous. And, and, and I'm, I, have, I have made it, made a promise to myself to find out why we're not doing a better job of helping people that, that if there's a need to give them food and living stamps, I can't understand uh, $15 helping them that much. I know of a case where one woman sat in her home for five days and lived on rice. Hmm. That's all she had. Uh, you know, you listeners, you don't, in the most part, you don't hear these stories. You don't hear some of the stuff I talk about on this radio show. But I hear it because... People call us for help, and that's why it's so important to uh, to understand why we do things and how we raise money. So Jennifer's been sort of uh, our board member that's been sort of tagged with uh, uh, putting the, the final touches on our, our car raffle. And uh, No pressure. <laughs> yeah. How about just take a couple of minutes, because I still got a couple of questions I want to ask Dr. White. So our car raffle is this weekend. It is Saturday at the Muscle Car Museum. You, there's still time to get tickets. We want you to go online at uh, helpingseniorscarraffle.com. Helping com. Yes. Um, buy your tickets. There will be a will call window. You can come on in. Um, we'll check you in and get you back into that incredibly huge beautiful museum there will be food and beverages it starts at 6 p.m ends at 9 p.m we'll be drawing the ticket for the the winner of one of three gorgeous cars from aj hires um it's going to be a great evening even if you're not a car person it's a fun night out it's a great date night but join the raffle buy your tickets they have three cars the challenger the uh, dodge ram truck and a Mazda Miata. I've driven all three. I'm really not sure which one I want. I like them all for different reasons. Um, the Challenger is a lot of fun to drive, though. It growls. So <laughs> you, you really might have to fight me for that one. But uh, come out <laughs> on Saturday. Um, join in the fun. It, it's going to be a great event. Like I said, 6 to 9, get your raffle tickets. You can buy tickets on Saturday if you would like to. We're just trying to make sure there's a good flow. So we don't want you to wait in line too long. So if you want to buy your tickets online at helpingseniorscarraffle.com, that would be fantastic. Okay. The other thing is I've had uh, a lot of people have been calling for and I, I, about tickets, and I told them that we're going to have a um, a fifty fifty, uh, and that has a, drawn more attention than I even thought it would. The fact that we're going to have a, a, right. a cash fifty fifty, and people, I've had people after they found out about that, and they have said, "This sounds like it's going to be a fun night," and that's. 
you know, last year we had 1,200 people that came to this event, and Mark Pylock said that, that our event was, he, he said, it was the nicest he had all year long. You know, and I forgot, I, I would be totally remiss if I did not mention that the Muddy River Boys are going to be there singing. That's your dad's? Yes, it is. <laughs> That's why yeah. I'd be in trouble if I didn't yeah, mention yeah, it. <laughs> Do we bar- need hearing protection? <laughs> hearing no, protection? They're, <laughs> they're not a rock band. It's a barbershop quartet. Okay, they will be <laughs> roving around. You'll see four handsome men in tuxedos roving around and singing. They're awesome, incredible new quartet that they've just put together. So uh, great sound. They'll be roaming around singing to everyone. Yeah. What's important, folks, is that uh, what we do at Helping Seniors is not just... Uh, trying to raise money or help people, but we're trying to put the program, a whole program together to uh, do the very best we can to provide a help network throughout Broward County. And that's why I I keep talking about the network on this radio station. We we strongly believe that, uh, you know, to make something successful, you have to make it work. You have to work at it. It It just doesn't happen. And, I'm getting feedback from people now that knew me when I was the director of the Alzheimer's program, and some of them believe that I'm still connected with the Alzheimer's Foundation. I'm not. All my energy is devoted to helping the seniors. And we have a lot of of very, very good business people, uh, people like the Eye Institute. We have... uh, we have uh, Dr. Lee Sheldon, a dentist. We have Bill Johnson, an elder law attorney. We have, you're one of our sponsors. We have uh, uh, assisted living facilities, Zon assisted living facility. And what's important, folks, is that I say 95 of our, well, close to 100% of our sponsors in some way help seniors. And it, it, we need to build an honest network of sponsors. Uh, and don't forget Hibiscus Court, uh, Ashley over Hibiscus Court has been a great help to me getting this all together. So yeah, and Ashley's gotten promoted. She's not not just at Hibiscus Court anymore. She's four facilities, and she's sort of the, like the marketing person for four facilities. And she still talks to me, so I'm really thankful. <laughs> yes, especially I won't I won't go there. Won't, <laughs> Behave yourself. Do anyway, there's one more thing I do want to talk about, and. Uh, uh, I had a call from a lady yesterday that um, uh, she is a, an example of what you can do with limited resources if you have to do it. And she called me to tell me that, uh, to thank me for making her aware of the Meals on Wheels program and the fact that Aging Matters has a... Uh, has over American Act money that can help seniors that need help with cleaning their house, cooking meals, and things like that. She's on their waiting list. Now, my question is, i got to find out why there's a waiting list for Meals on Wheels. And uh, the truth of it is that uh, uh, some programs just need to be better managed. And I, I, I've, I've, I've been reluctant in and saying things about other organizations over the years because you don't want to make enemies, but sometimes you have to to force an issue. And if people are getting millions of dollars from the federal government to serve people, then we need to use that money primarily to serve people and not pay overhead costs. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I very strongly believe it. I take nothing for the work I do. I realize that I'm in a forced situation and I can get away with doing it. Not everyone can. The last thing I want to ask about before I go back with Liz is that on this thing, you talked about a uh, senior 60 uh, and a older can go to lunch and socialize, and uh, and to do that, they go to uh, 639-8770. But how about talk about what, what do you mean by this, uh, uh, the uh, shared lunch programs and stuff like that? And, so the Seniors at Lunch program is an Aging Matters program that most people don't know about. So I thought, you know, as we come on the radio station, we try to highlight a different resource each time. We did the Elmore program the last time I was on. And this time I thought I would like to talk about Seniors at Lunch because no one really knows that it exists. And it's a great program um, that you can go to a local 
community centers, senior centers. Some of, of them are at churches. There's 12 different ones, uh, 12 different locations throughout the county. And you can go there. It's a Meals on Wheels lunch, but it's in a community setting. You're sitting and, and socializing with other people. There are typically games. It's a lot of fun, and it's a way for seniors to get out and to be social, which is so important, not to be isolated, but to get out and talk to other people. And in many of the locations, they have busing, so they can come pick you up and take you out to lunch. So it's a, a great program. Get a nice hot meal, enjoy some company, um, and probably get transportation to and from for a very small fee um, or no fee at all. So it's just a, another program out there that people need to take advantage of. Yeah, and the other thing on this, what Jennifer was talking about, folks, if you go to these things and you feel that um, – the pressure is being put on you to make a donation or to do something like that, call our office at uh, 473-7770 and let me know because that's not supposed to happen. Uh, these these programs are provided with uh, through federal funding, and uh, they're for a reason. They're there to not only help people get a good meal, but they're also there to help people socialize and to get people out of uh, just living singly. So, all right, back to Dr. Wright. Dr. White gave me some qu couple of questions that she wanted to talk about, and there were there are number four and number five on our list of uh, five. And, and Joe, I, I actually asked those questions because I, I had talked to uh, the good doctor before and thought that those were really important things to that people should know about. So th you, those were my questions. Those are your questions? <laughs> yes, I asked really good questions, didn't I? Yeah, you sure did. You surprised me. I'll tell you there. Because uh, I thought, man, that's pretty good. Well, thank you. <laughs> so we'll She's see top. What, we'll see what Dr. White can ask you, answer these questions. All right. Question four was, how can hearing aids help someone age more successfully? And number five was if you have a patient that is completely resistant to wearing hearing aids, what words of wisdom or advice can you give? And she's got those two questions sitting in front of her. So, so I can remember them because my about, memory. you got about six minutes to talk. Okay. So number four, how can hearing aids help someone age more successfully? Now, I've already talked a little bit about the hearing loss and dementia connection there. Um, but managing hearing loss early is one way to prevent or delay the dementia cases. And like I said before, if you see someone sitting alone, looking aloof, maybe it's really not that. Maybe we don't need to go for all that testing neurologically. Maybe we should really start simply with just audiological testing. It takes a half hour to give us an answer. Um, what was I just thought of something I wanted to say and it's, it's gone. Um, well, and if, if you're not hearing and you're not participating, you know, going back to that socialization piece there, is so you. important. The socialization is huge. And I'm so happy to learn about seniors at lunch because I have so many patients that are alone and, you know, they don't know about this. So it's great for me to be able to give them a handout and tell them about this now so that they will be aware. And if there's transportation, that's even better. That's fantastic. Um, brain exercise is important. So communication, socialization, talking to someone, even maybe sitting at home, reading a book out loud to yourself, all of this, if we're just constantly stimulating, that's good, as long as the noise is not too loud. And then, patient, I mean, question number five, if a, you have a patient that is completely resistant to wearing hearing aids, what do you do? What, what words of wisdom? That happens all too often. And there are so many times where if the patient is still in denial, patient does not want to do anything, I step back. If their family is forcing them, if their spouse is forcing them, if their children are forcing them, they're the ones that have to come to the realization first that they're not hearing so well. Sometimes it works that we can do a little demo in the office, but then they say, well, I, I do fine sitting right across from you, which is the truth. P people tend to do better one-to-one. -one. But if we can do maybe a demo for a couple of days out in their real-world setting, then come back in, take the hearing aids and say, well, how, do, how was it? wow, my TV went from the volume of 72 down to 32. But if they're truly resistant, I don't push the matter. I wait for them to come back around. Wait a minute. Now, you said something. About, do you give somebody like a hearing aid device to wear? Demos. I do. Oh, the, uh, so I have patients that come in. Like today I saw someone this morning. She has been um, 
wanting to come see me. I tested her hearing. She said, I know I'm not hearing so well. She works at a school where she's around a lot of small children with squeaky little voices. And so she, I tested her hearing today, put a demo pair on her, and I'll see her back next week. And she'll let me know if she's ready. That is really awesome. Well, you don't know what you don't know. I always say that. It's like you don't know what you're missing until you have it for a little bit. And then we come back in and said, well, how was it? Well, it was great. I even took them off and compared listening with, listening without. And wow, what a difference. What kind of a hearing aid would you give somebody to, to wear to test? So I- kind of like the one that you're wearing. And then I have four different levels of technology. So I can set it to be low end technology or I can set it to be high end technology right. and kind of, and that's where I, you have to talk to the patient to know more about their, their lifestyle. If they have an easygoing lifestyle, they don't need something so sophisticated. But one of my other big things is, is that primary care doctors, internists, family med, they're not talking to people about their hearing because they're communicating fine one-on-one in that exam room. But really there's so much hearing loss that is prevalent that we don't know about because no one comes in to get their hearing tested. Did I tell my story about the 19 year old and the 48 year old, a mother daughter? Okay. So a a few weeks ago I had a mom call me and say, I think my daughter's not hearing well. She's 19 years old. I tested both of their hearing. Guess who has the worst hearing? The The 19 year old -old. because she's been using earphones, listening to music probably for nine or 10 years. You drive by the bus stops, you see these kids, Music, music, music all the time. They get home. Music, music, music. So they're constantly assaulting their ears with noise. And then guess what? She probably wouldn't have got her hearing tested for another 50 years. So we need to start talking about preventative medicine. Okay. I'm I'm going to ask you a question. Yeah. We have got to work on Dr. Liz to be at least one of our $350 $350 a year sponsors. <laughs> Look, I already so, put a note right here. Well, that's good because, uh, he, he, Dr. White, honestly, uh, you're the type of person that, uh, that I like to have on the show because you're able to um, uh, converse over, over, a tel- over, a, over a mic and, and put it in, into uh, words, things that people need to understand and need to know about in in a way that they can accept. And one of the hardest things in doing radio and television work is to put together a show that uh, that people want to come back and hear and listen to again. And I hope that uh, some of you that are listening to the show today will call me at 321 473 seven 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 zero and tell me whether or not you like what dr white was talking about today i'm i'm really serious this time i i want some of you to call me and tell me what you thought today uh, i'm 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 not just asking i'm begging you to do it because i, I really want to know this time so we're almost out of time. I want to thank Jennifer and I want to thank you, Dr. White. Thank you. Um, thank you. I know, Jennifer, you always have words of wisdom, but uh, since you're the one that got Dr. White here, let's let her wrap the show up today. Dr. White, what's the last thing that you would like to say besides giving me your telephone number so that people know how to contact you? How do they contact you? 321-723-4663. And what's the name of your business? Harbor City Hearing Solutions. And folks, I I strongly advise you to at least call a woman and 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 get it. Are consultations free or they are free? Yes. There you go. You can't ask for a better deal than that. And I think it's sometimes that the ones of us that are stubborn (laughs) and are uh, not willing to to admit that we need help need to do it. Uh, Jennifer, any comment? Nope. That's amazing. She doesn't have anything to say. I'm anyway. behaving. Okay. All right. Thank you, Dr. White, and thank you, Jennifer, for being on the show today. And uh, I'll, uh, we'll have, yep, see you Saturday at the bar- barbecue, so, uh, barbecue at, the, at the Muscle Car Museum. So anybody wants to come can still come. Give us a call and enjoy the week. Bye-bye.